I'd like to say a few things about uh, my memories of working on this uh, particular um, story for Doctor Who. I was a very young man at the time, and it was a tremendous chance for me um, to play Richard the Lionheart, for goodness sake. And I was very young, and um, I was extraordinarily flattered to play someone who was uh, such a great hero of the English nation and all that. Um, I remember Douglas Canfield, I do remember getting the part. I was in the garden, um, whatever I was doing, I don't know. My wife came running out, Julian, Julian, Douglas Canfield, on Douglas Canfield. Yes, he wants you to do something on telly. Well, go on, cry, cracky. And, um, and there was Douglas on the phone saying, would I play Richard the Lionheart? And I was thrilled to, thrilled to bits. And actually he asked me to play Richard the Lionheart again in the film of Ivanhoe, many, many years later when I was <laughs> certainly not a young man, mm, youngish. Um, so Douglas and I uh, were very close together on Richard's. Um, I, I remember the garden, the, the, the corner of the garden, it was a tiny little garden we had in South London, um, the corner of the garden I was actually poking around in when, when Douglas rang. It's funny those memory things that happened to you. I can't remember the flowers that were there though, and all actually what I was doing. Anyway. Um, it was a very happy engagement, uh, generally speaking, um, mostly because of the actors, who, uh, some of whom I met for the first time and some not for the first time. Um, and I remember being very impressed by the way the sets and costumes were arranged. Um, at that time, Doctor Who, as we know, was in its early years, and uh, they weren't spending too much on it, frankly. And uh, they managed to construct really very, well, I thought, uh, uh, interesting and um, persuasive sets, settings. And considering we did the whole thing in the studio, there was no location work, um, I think that really the Douglas did awfully well and the designer team and the, the costume people. Uh, we were very comfortable in our clothes, I remember. Um, uh, and the swords and things seemed to sort of work. And that we were, though I think from some of the pictures uh, uh, you might see we look a little little bit gauche, but we didn't feel gauche at the time. I think it's probably a matter of the, the period and the time and uh, all that. I suppose that the reason I got the part was because of my history beforehand. With, I've done a lot of Shakespeare, I've done a great deal more since. Um, but a, a very famous series, which some of you may remember, uh, called An Age of Kings, which was Shakespeare's history plays through from Richard II through to Richard III. And uh, I played a lot of parts in that. I was part of that repertory company. and. Uh, I think that Douglas had seen a lot of that, and, and I played one particular king who was not unlike um, Edward IV, who was not unlike Richard, Richard I, so uh, that was probably the, the key. Um, of course I had a false beard and all that, and um, which was stuck on for me, extraordinarily uncomfortable, and um, I did wear my signet ring, which was a, a good thing to do, my, my own signet ring, which was nice. Um, the actors of the people really that um, I, I've, I've continued to, to to like very much. Maureen O'Brien became uh, a, a very good friend uh, through that series. Um, we don't see each other very often, but when we do, we, we delight in each other, and it's a very, very, very nice um, relationship. Um, Jean Marsh, of course, I did know from beforehand, um, and we were simply delighted to play brother and sister in it, and it was a very interesting story. We, I remember um, we had to play down the possible incestuous side. We wanted to play that. Um, because it is a very strongly held theory that there was an incestuous relationship between them. Um, but it was at a time when television it was a children's television, etc., etc., we couldn't do that. Um, but we didn't mind. <laughs> we played what we had. And she's remained a friend, and um, she is now, now the best friend of my first wife, who was the one who called me from the garden, um, the actress Eileen Atkins, who I'm sure a lot of you will remember. And uh, she works a lot in America now, Jean. And we see each other quite often, and we're very friendly. Um, there were other actors on that. Um, Jacqueline, of course, Hill. Um, uh, we got very friendly at the time, but then she went and married Alvin Rakoff, the um, Canadian television director, and went off to live in Toronto, uh, who I met actually about six years ago when I was out there making a movie, and we had a dinner, and that was, that was jolly nice. Bernard Kay, um, uh, I didn't meet again until the Stratford season uh, with the Royal Shakespeare Company, at Stratford in 1992, six was it? I can't remember. When we were both in the same company, and uh, when I was playing Henry the Fourth, and he was playing Glendower, the wild Welsh wizard, um, and actually he uh, he went on to take over another part that I'd done, um, 
uh, in an, an Inspector Calls, which is a very successful production of that priestly play, which is still on in London now. And I think actually Bernard at the moment is playing it, though the time span for your the purposes of this interview is uh, not interesting, is it? We're talking in 2000, the year 2000. Um, and he's remained um, a, a very nice acquaintance. Um, Tony Caunter, um, I also have worked with several times since then, and he's most memorable as one of the most amusing men I've ever met in my life. Also, he's an a absolutely screaming film buff. He knows everything about movies. I mean, he would make light of this conversation I'm having with you now, because he would fill in on everything, the cameraman, the lighting person, and that costume person, and all the other actors and people who I couldn't remember, he would fill in. So Tony Corner is a very happy memory. Walter Randall, um, uh, very um, wild, and um, he used to run a nightclub in London, I remember, um, down in Chelsea. Um, and we used to go down there and have tremendously good times because the drinks were, were, were cheap when Walter um, let us have them. <laughs> so we enjoyed that very much. It was a very, very, um, it was a very happy time. Bill Hartnell, of course, um, you'll all be wanting to know about Bill, um, was a tricky chap. Um, uh, he was, as we know, the founder member of, of Doctor Who. He created Doctor Who and um, some will say um, it remains the best presentation of the, the most interesting character of, of the many that there have been. Um, uh, he was not very friendly, I have to say, to the visiting actors, um, but he was a great perfectionist. This is probably the reason. And if you didn't um, quite get right exactly what he needed uh, and what he thought was needed for the whole thing, not just for him, um, then he was very ratty and irritable. On the other hand, suddenly he would smile and, uh, and, and accept you into his world and, and you felt that you'd been given a great big present. Um, but I would say that generally speaking my experience of Bill was well, quite rough really. Well I was playing Richard the Lionheart after all. <laughs> Richard Plantagenet was born in Oxfordshire, England in the year 1157, the third son of King Henry II. He was a child of Aquitaine, a part of southern France. His native language, therefore, was not English, and throughout his life he spoke little of it. Known to history as Coeur de Lion, or Lionheart, because of his bravery in battle. He is epitomised as a great warrior and a noble king. In reality, Richard had little time for England, and spent only six months of his ten-year reign on English soil. In 1187, Richard learned of the tragic loss at Hattin, where the Crusaders had lost Jerusalem to the Saracen leader Al-Malik al-Nasir Salah ed-Din Yusuf, known to Europeans as Saladin. Upon the death of his father, Henry II, in 1189, Richard was crowned King of England in Westminster Abbey, London. Richard had only one ambition, to lead a crusade against Saladin and recapture Jerusalem. Richard stayed in England only long enough to make the necessary arrangements to fund the crusade. To this end he sold everything that could be sold, manors, castles, towns, privileges, sheriffdoms and other public offices. Richard was in a hurry and is reported to have said, I would sell London if only I could find someone rich enough to buy it. He imposed a hefty tax on the English people called a Saladin tithe as a means of aiding his war effort. He set sail from Dover and was soon en route to the Holy Lands.